Greetings, welcome to this evening's Ken and Jean Hansen lecture sponsored by the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College. Tonight's lecture features Dr. Kristen Page, Professor of Biology at Wheaton, giving the first of three presentations on the topic, Creation's Call, Stewardship Lessons from Middle Earth and Narnia. Tonight's respondent will be Dr. Christina Bieber-Lake, the Clyde S. Kelby Professor of English. During and after the presentation and the response, you're welcome to pose questions to each speaker through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, not the chat button, the Q&A button. My co-director, Dr. Crystal Downing, will be curating questions from audience members and posing them to tonight's speakers. The Ken and Jean Hansen Lectureship is an annual Wheaton College faculty lecture series named in honor of former Wheaton trustee Ken Hansen and his wife Jean and endowed in their memory by Walter and Darlene Hansen. Tonight's lecture is entitled Searching Fictional Landscapes to Guide Our View of Our Own World. Dr. Kristen Page is the Ruth Kraft Strohschein Distinguished Professor and Professor of Biology here at Wheaton. Uh, in tonight's lecture, she will be exploring fictional landscapes of J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis as a means to aid us in developing a greater real life appreciation for God's creation. Dr. Page earned her MS at, in Zoology and Wildlife from Auburn University and her PhD in Forestry and Natural Resources from Purdue University. Dr. Page has particular expertise in wildlife diseases and how transmission changes when landscapes are altered by human use. She's also developed mitigation strategies to decrease transmission of wildlife diseases and has a special interest in environmentally related public health issues. So now let's listen and learn from Dr. Page's presentation, Searching Fictional Landscapes to Guide Our View of Our Own World. Dr. Page. Thank you, Dr. Downing. Thank you, everybody. I'm gonna share my screen. Well, it's exciting to be here tonight. I'm so honored to be the Ken and Jean Hanser lecturer, Hanson lecturer this year. I'm really thankful for this opportunity to combine two of my loves, literature and ecology. I wanna thank the Hansons and everyone at the Wade Center for this opportunity. My lecture tonight is accompanied by my photography. And I do this because I hope that you can glimpse some of the places in creation that I love. And at the same time, I hope you experience the images that are coming to me when I'm spending time in fictional landscapes and considering my responsibility towards creation care. I have always gravitated towards forests and I think I've always connected to them deeply. In fact, there's a recording of a conversation between my father and me as a two-year-old, in which my dad asked, Kristen, where is heaven? And I exclaimed with certainty that it's in the woods. I love every kind of forest, those I physically walk through and those I mentally walk through as I read. As an ecologist, I spend a lot of time exploring and learning in real forests. Thus, I can experience fictional forests more deeply. I have no doubt that I can experience literary landscapes so deeply because of my experiences in physical landscapes. As a result, I wonder if those who spend more time in fictional landscapes than actual ones might start to experience nature differently. Could literary landscapes teach us to see creation in a new way and possibly even motivate readers towards environmental stewardship? One of my favorite literary landscapes is the place between worlds and C.S. Lewis is the magician's nephew. When I read about this place, I'm transported to the many forested landscapes that I visited in my life. Listen to Lewis's description of Diggory's first impressions. All the light was green light that came through the leaves, but there must have been a very strong sun overhead for this green daylight was bright and warm. It was the quietest wood you could possibly imagine. There were no birds, no insects, and no animals, and no wind. You could almost feel the trees growing. The pool he had just got out of was not the only pool. There were dozens of others, a pool every few yards as far as his eyes could reach. You could almost feel the trees drinking the water up with their roots. This wood was very much alive. When he tried to describe it afterward, Diggory always said, it was a rich place, as rich as plum cake. The strangest thing was that almost before he had looked about him, Diggory had half forgotten how he had come there. If anyone had asked him, where did you come from? 
he would have probably have said, I've always been here. That's what it felt like, as if one had always been in that place and never been bored, although nothing had ever happened. As he said long afterward, it's not the sort of place where things happen. The trees go on growing, that's all. What did you imagine while I was reading this? While it's hard for me to imagine literal stillness and quiet, no birds, no insects, no animals, or no wind, in any of the forests that I know, I understand what is being described. When I'm in a forest, I experience a stillness, a quieting of my soul. Like Lewis, I understand that forests are not the sort of place things happen, at least not the everyday things that distract us from what is important. In forests, I find that I can join the psalmist in experiencing the promise, be still and know that I am God. When I read about Lewis's forest in the place between worlds, I can truly understand and experience this place. Perhaps as Diggory did in The Magician's Nephew, because I have experience in actual forests. In fact, experiencing this fictional landscape makes me want to go and find familiar, familiar places. I want to find places where trees go on growing. Don't you wish this too? I love reading as much as I love exploring landscapes, whether forests, mountains, prairies, or wetlands. I read books to learn, to worship, to teach, to escape, and to relax. I'm particularly drawn to books about nature or those with settings that enable me to feel part of nature through detailed descriptions. By reading such books, I have gained a desire both to be in nature as well as to protect it. I've also developed what Aldo Leopold, a famous conservation biologist and the father of wildlife biology, defines as a land ethic. As such, I understand that I'm part of a community that extends beyond people to include plants, animals, and all of creation. Robert McFarlane, an author of several books about place, literature, and imagination writes, whenever I ask professional conservationists what first inspired them to get involved in the protection of the environment, they invariably mention a book or a place. It is my experience that many of us who have pursued conservation as a vocation connect strongly to places, even places discovered in books. As a result, we can easily connect fictional places with particular locations we know that need protection or restoration. Love for these places, both fictional and actual, is enough to motivate us to environmental action. It is also true that those of us who pursue environmental stewardship are often drawn to written works about nature. McFarland suggests that most people, however, are not motivated to action simply through reading nature writing. He argues that those of us who are motivated by the writings of naturalists were probably already interested and inclined towards environmental action even before we read those works. Likewise, to those without a deep-seated inclination towards or interest in the natural world, books about nature can seem uninteresting, pious, or even tending towards propaganda. However, these same people are often strongly drawn to the grand fictional landscapes created by authors like C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien in their stories. For some of these readers, as they learn to care about these fictional locations, they're also awakened to the beauty of the created world in which they live. Accordingly, they may begin to care about the conservation and protection of the landscape surrounding them. In their work, Narnia and the Fields of Arbol, Dickerson and O'Hara argue that people are sometimes willing to listen to ideas that come in the form of story that they would not listen to in the form of abstract argument. Further, they also maintain that in order for readers to be motivated to environmental action from the stories they read, they must have formed a personal connection with these fictional landscapes. J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis both created landscapes that readers seem to connect with, including descriptions of fictional places that their readers know intimately and love to explore. For example, Tolkien's subcreation of Middle Earth provides a setting for his stories that connect the readers to real landscapes, ranging from swamps and forests 
to mountains and grasslands. In particular, the Hobbit's beloved Shire was based upon the rural land in the West Midlands of England, where Tolkien spent his boyhood. Likewise, Lewis's creation of Narnia reflects the landscapes he loved to walk across in the Belfast countryside. Thus, both Tolkien's and Lewis's personal experience of the natural world allowed them to create familiar places that readers can recognize and envision for themselves as they read the stories. Stories that speak of truths, including environmental truths about the vulnerabilities of nature when actions within the stories destroy rather than protect the created world. Everyone has some kind of connection to place. When I teach ecology, I often start the course by asking my students to think of their favorite place in nature and to describe it to me. I remind them that there are many aspects to place. There are elements that can be described using our senses. What do you see? What do you smell? What do you hear? Dare you taste something? There are also relationships that they can describe, but this requires a bit of observation. And finally, they need to notice the processes like climate that shapes everything from what our senses are telling us to what is happening with the relationships. Essentially, what the students are doing in this exercise is they're describing their home landscape. My students are thinking about a familiar place, one they connect with, that they feel drawn to. The home they describe could be their literal backyard, or it could be any place where they find the stillness the psalmist describes. I call this activity reading landscapes. It involves scanning, recognizing, identifying, and interpreting a place with the hope of learning, worshiping, teaching, escaping, and relaxing. Reading the landscape involves paying attention to one's surroundings in order to understand what attributes make the place unique. As a landscape is explored, the reader considers common species making up the specific community, like robins in a maple tree, or gray squirrel collecting acorns. And the reader also delights with every surprising discovery, like a visiting scarlet tanager high in the top of a burrow, or a roaming red fox sneaking along the honeysuckle hedge. And they consider how they personal inter personally interact with the place. Reading landscapes includes not only the flora and the fauna, but also the habitat. Interestingly, landscape is a term used by many disciplines to describe the attributes of a place. For example, scientists might be interested in the elements of the land that explain the natural processes, like ecosystem services, while artists may be interested in connecting feelings or memories or longings to the land by focusing on elements of the landscape that are familiar. This is why when we enter Middle Earth at the beginning of The Hobbit, we're not disoriented. For what child has not dreamed of digging out a fort or a hideaway? I'm guessing that most of these attempts resulted in a hole that wasn't nearly as, well, nearly as welcoming as the child had envisioned. But this is where Tolkien starts with the development of his landscape. In a hole, in the ground lived a hobbit. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell, nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit down on or eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. The description of what the whole is not and the similarity to the shared experiences of many children is exactly what orients the reader to the comfort of the hobbit hole. Shared experiences allow us to understand landscapes, whether we've spent time in them or not. In this way, the landscapes of Tolkien and Lewis extend beyond mere settings for a story. Rather, these authors have created worlds with specific geologies, geographies, ecologies, and cultures. Just like in actual landscapes, readers can experience these created landscapes at different scales. For example, in the terrain of The Hobbit, the reader can experience the detail of the path. We read, as they went on, Bilbo looked from side to side for something to eat. But the blackberries were still only in flower, and of course there were no nuts, not even hawthorn berries. They still went on and on. The rough path disappeared the bushes and the long grasses between the boulders, the patches of rabbit crop turf, the thyme and the sage and the marjoram and the yellow rock roses all vanished. And they found themselves at the top 
of a wide steep slope of fallen stones, the remains of a landslide. And then we see a grand sweeping vista of the journey. Now they could look back over the lands they had left, laid out behind them far below, far, far away in the west, where things were blue and faint. Bilbo knew there lay his own country of safe and comfortable things and his little hobbit hole. Regardless of the scale, there are elements of the landscape that orient the reader to a place of comfort because they connect the reader to elements that are familiar. The created landscapes of Lewis and Tolkien are believable because each author actually spent time in nature, learning to read actual landscapes, in addition to spending time in literary landscapes as they read throughout their lives. C.S. Lewis created imagined landscapes for most of his life. In Surprised by Joy, he describes his boyhood fictional creation, Animal Land, as a place of anthropomorphized beast that entertained his imagination. Even though he describes his drawings as lacking beauty and having a shocking ignorance of natural form, Lewis says, this absence of beauty, now that I come to think of it, is characteristic of our childhood. However, a biscuit tin garden made by his brother with moss, twigs, and flowers was brought to the nursery one day. And Lewis says that that was the birth, first beauty he knew. The moss garden of Lewis's childhood perhaps was a seed for the imagined landscapes of his fiction, since he wrote that it first made him aware of nature. C.S. Lewis loved walking across landscapes, and he was certainly influenced by what he experienced. For example, in October 1918, he wrote in a letter to his boyhood friend, Arthur Greaves, Savernake Woods, doesn't that breathe of romance? I have been in Savernake Woods this morning. You get clear of the village, cross a couple of fields, and then a sunken chalky road leads you right into the wood. It is full of beech and oak, but also of those little bushy things that grow out of the earth in four or five different trunks. Green walks of grass with thick wood on either side led off the road and we followed one of these down and found our way back by long detours. As Lewis explains in another letter to Arthur, his experience went beyond lines and colors, but extended to smells, sounds, and tastes. Lewis further described how as he walked, he thought of literature or opera and considered how beloved scenes might play out in the landscape where he was walking. He said, I was always involuntarily looking for scenes that might belong to the Wagnerian world. Here a steep hillside covered with firs where Mime might meet Sieglinde. There a sunny glade where Siegfried might listen to the bird. But soon nature ceased to be a mere reminder of the books and became herself the medium of the real joy. Spending time in nature certainly impacted Lewis's creativity. And as a result, his readers experienced many of his fictional landscapes in the same way that he explored actual landscapes. As the characters walk or journey, the landscapes unfold. For example, in this passage from Out of the Silent Planet, the first book in Lewis's space trilogy, we read, they walked forward beside the channel. In a few minutes, Ransom saw a new landscape. The channel was not only a shallow, but a rapid. The first indeed of a series of rapids by which the water descended steeply for the next half mile. The ground fell away before them and the canyon or hondramit continued at a very much lower level. Its walls, however, did not sink with it. And from his present position, Ransom got a clearer notion of the lie of the land. Because Lewis spent so much time walking across many landscapes, he's able to create something beautiful and familiar in an entirely new landscape on a planet previously unknown to the reader. Just as Lewis learned to love nature from the biscuit tin garden created by his brother Warren, Tolkien was introduced to the beauty of the natural world by his mother and her love of botany and gardening. Tolkien cultivated his own love of plants and especially trees throughout his life. He spent enough time in nature reading landscapes to be able to know the intricacies of natural rhythms. In a letter to his son, Christopher, he describes in detail the flowering and leaf out sequence of the trees in his garden. The oaks were among the earliest trees to be leafed, equaling or beating birch, beech, and lime. 
great cauliflowers of brilliant yellow ochre tasseled with flowers. While the ashes in the same situations were dark, dead, with hardly even a visible sticky bud. Tolkien's observations and knowledge of nature allowed him to create fictional landscapes described in such detail that plant guides have been written and taxonomic keys have been developed to help the reader navigate Middle-earth. These familiar elements of landscape allow the reader to become immersed in the imaginative. Tolkien explains in a 1964 interview with BBC that elements of his fictional landscapes were based on the place where memory and imagination come together. And he said that the Shire is very much like the kind of world in which I first became aware of things. Middle Earth represents the actual old world of this planet, but Tolkien does not claim to relate the shape of the mountains and the land masses. Rather, he describes his created landscapes as at a different stage of imagination. He explains, mine is not an imaginary world, but an imaginary historical moment in Middle Earth, which is our habituation. Well, because Middle Earth is our habituation, we might expect to recognize elements of the habitable lands of our world. Time spent in nature reading landscapes helped Lewis and Tolkien create realistic and relatable places for their fictional works to develop. Yet they are much more than settings for stories. They have created worlds that are familiar to their readers, ecosystems that we can understand and even experience as we journey with the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve or the fellowship. These created landscapes play a role in transforming characters as they pass on their journeys and readers might also experience transformations as they participate in the journeys of the characters. For example, landscapes dominated by forests often are important to the action of the story, as if they too are characters. In Lewis's The Last Battle, the trees call King Tyrion to action, even if indirectly. He's sitting under a great oak, enjoying pleasant spring weather, and he starts receiving messages of Aslan's return to Narnia from the birds and the squirrels. Just as Tyrion is questioning the rumors of the return of Aslan to Narnia, a dryad of a beech tree comes to him with an urgent message. She says, whoa, 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 woe for my brothers and sisters, woe for the holy trees, the woods are laid waste, the ax is loosed against us, we are being felled, great trees are falling, 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 King Tyrion responds by rushing to the aid of the ancient forest. Yet he's too late for many of the trees, we read. Right through the middle of that ancient forest, that forest where the trees of gold and silver had once grown, a broad lane had already been opened. It was hideous, like a raw gash in the land full of muddy ruts where felled trees had been dragged down to the river. Tyrion's response to the injustices he discovers should provide an example for us. There are many real landscapes that are experiencing similar destruction, yet we do not respond. Perhaps our response to the devastating scene in the last battle is more compassionate than our response to the devastation of real landscapes, because in the story, we understand the trees to be alive and able to speak. In the short space of a chapter, we're able to realize that these trees are being devastated for the economic gain of those who do not even live in the country, the Kalormans. Do we respond differently when we can directly link devastation in our world to consumerism and economic pursuit? The same story is playing out in our lives too. Yet because we're unaware or unconcerned, we fail to act. Actual forests are being lost at a rate of 200,000 kilometers square per year. And just as in the story, the trees are being sold to people who do not live among the forests. The forests of Brazil, the Democratic Republic of Congo and Indonesia are being cut at the fastest rates in the world to make way for beef production, soy production and palm oil plantations to satisfy the consumers of the developed world. Could the compassion for forests stirred by Lewis transform our reactions to the devastation of real forests? Tolkien is known for his love of trees, 
And like Lewis, he created landscapes that transformed characters and readers alike. In a letter to the editor of the Daily Telegraph, Tolkien describes the importance of trees and forests in his works and how the actions of those entering forests change the character of the forest. Tolkien says, in all my works, I take the part of trees as against all their enemies. Lothlorien is beautiful because there the trees were loved. Elsewhere, forests are represented as awakening to consciousness of themselves. The old forest was hostile to the two-legged creatures because of the memory of many injuries. Fanghorn Forest was old and beautiful, but at the time of the story tense with hostility because it was threatened by a machine-loving enemy. Mirkwood had fallen under the domination of a power that hated all living things, but was restored to beauty and became green with the great before the end of the story. Tolkien's landscapes, especially forests, are alive and make important contributions to the story. Merkelbach describes Tolkien's forests as transformative spaces. And just as the forest is characterized by its history, those entering the forest are changed when they leave. The hobbits are reluctant to enter the old forest. They recognize the forest as alive and more aware of what is going on than things were in the Shire. They comment that the trees do not like strangers and often bar their way by shifting. As they leave the darkness of the forest behind and begin to have some notion of where they were along the river Withley Windle, they encounter old man Willow. Tom Bombadil arrives just in time, just as old man Willow has trapped Marion Pippin, perhaps exacting justice for past wrongs against the forest. The Hobbit's experience in the old forest transforms them and prepares them to continue their journey. But their experience with Tom Bombadil also teaches them something about their place in nature and perhaps even their responsibility towards it. We read, as they listened, they began to understand the lives of the forest apart from themselves. Indeed, to feel themselves as the strangers where all other things were at home. Treebeard furthers the education of Mary and Pippin about how landscapes reveal the ambitions of those living there. Banghorn Forest was once vast and full of thick, strong and young trees. But at the time of the meeting of Treebeard and Marion Pippin, it was a remnant of its former magistry. It had succumbed to the desires of Saruman, the wizard, who at one point seemed interested in learning and knowing about the forest, but ended up not caring for growing things, except as far as they could serve him for the moment. So when we enter Fanghorn Forest as readers, we're experiencing deforestation the orcs and Saruman are making havoc, cutting trees to feed the fires of Orthanc, but also taking more than was needed and wasting many trees by leaving them to rot. Treebeard laments the way that knowledge of the forest has allowed Saruman to extract resources to fuel the fires that will help him to attain more power. In his lament, Treebeard challenges us to action. He says, curse him root and branch. Many of those trees were my friends creatures I had known from nut and acorn. Many had voices of their own that are lost forever now. And there are wastes of stump and bramble where once there were singing groves. I've been idle. I've let things slip. It must stop. I will stop it, he boomed. And you shall come with me. You may be able to help me. Now, when I walk through forests and trip over a root, I wonder if it was my clumsiness or the forest's intention. I no longer experience forests the way that I did before I spent time journeying through the literary forests of Tolkien and Lewis. Is it possible that spending time in fictional landscapes might transform all of our attitudes about nature? Despite the biblical support for creation care, many Christians believe that environmentalism should be separate from a life of faith. Politicization of environmental issues has resulted in at best apathy and at worst vehement denial of environmental problems like climate change. I've been told by pastor theologians that creation care is not urgent and is at most a second tier problem for the church. 
comments like these lead many environmentalists to blame Christians for the current situation of environmental degradation. In the now famous essay, The Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis, Lynn White asserts that the state of the environment is rooted in Christocentric attitudes. He says, our science and technology have grown out of Christian attitudes towards man's relation to nature, which are almost universally held, not only by Christians and neo-Christians, but also by those who fondly regard themselves as post-Christians. Despite Copernicus, all the cosmos rotates around our little globe. Despite Darwin, we are not in our hearts part of the natural process. We are superior to nature, contemptuous of it, willing to use it for our slightest whim. Aldo Leopold, a forester, conservationist, and influential writer who I mentioned earlier, would seemingly agree with White. In his famous collection of essays, A Sand County Almanac, he encourages the development of a land ethic that would move people beyond this Christocentric idea that humans are distinct from nature. Leopold argued, that ethics need to move beyond those dealing with relationships only between individuals. So this would include mosaic decalogue, including God. We need to move beyond those dealing with relationships between individuals and society or the golden rule. Leopold would say that we need to include relationships with the land, animals, and plants in our ethic. Further, he maintains when Christians understand Genesis to mean that humans are to have rights to creation through dominion, then the land relation will be strictly economic, entailing privileges, but not obligations. This attitude promotes consumerism and excess use of resources, which facilitates the rapid transformation of landscapes and subsequent loss of biodiversity. Lynn White continues in his essay, The Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis, to explain the destructive influence of this attitude. He was writing this essay in 1967, and he said, Ronald Reagan, the newly elected governor of California, like myself a churchman, but less trouble than I, spoke for the Christian tradition when he said, as is alleged, when you've seen one redwood tree, you've seen them all. To a Christian, a tree can be no more than a physical fact. The whole concept of the sacred grove is alien to Christianity and to the ethos of the West. For nearly two millennia, Christian missionaries have been chopping down sacred groves, which are idolatrous because they assume spirit and nature. What, do we do, what we do about ecology depends on our ideas of the man-nature relationship. More science and more technology are not going to get us out of the present ecological crisis until we find a new religion or rethink our old one. Rethinking our Christian responsibility to steward creation is especially urgent today as we experience unprecedented losses of biodiversity and rapidly changing climate. Certainly, the fictional writings of Lewis and Tolkien were not specifically intended to motivate people towards environmental action, yet they both acknowledged that their writings changed the reader just as they had been changed by writings of others. For example, Lewis realized that he had personally been influenced by literature. He described the effect that George MacDonald's Fantasties had on his own life and imagination as, the quality which had enchanted me in MacDonald's imaginative works turned out to be the quality of the real universe, the divine, magical, terrifying, and ecstatic reality in which we all live. According to Dickerson and O'Hara, Lewis hoped that his stories would impact his readers and as he had been influenced by the stories of others. And in so doing, allowing the reader to understand our situation from a new perspective that is separate from current politics and selfish desires. Dickerson and Evans argue that Tolkien used myth for storytelling because myth fosters imagination, which is critical to developing solutions to societal issues including environmental problems. Lewis and Tolkien both demonstrate a well-developed land ethic in their writings and seem to be encouraging the reader towards some type of movement towards creation care. In fact, some readers spending time with their stories and in the fictional landscapes they have created are changed. This is the case for Bill McKibben, 
environmental activist, author, and founder of 350.org, a global movement against climate change. He told me, Lewis was entirely important for me. The Narnia books are the most important literature of my life, I think. No landscape is more set in my mind than the edge of the sea, with Reepy Cheep climbing into his tiny canoe, except perhaps the heaven described in the last battle, further up and farther in. I've spent my life as an activist, I think, in large part because I spent my boyhood reading C.S. Lewis. For Bill McKibben, a childhood spent in the fictional landscapes of Narnia cultivated a strong land ethic and sense of justice. The work of 350.org reflects many of the ideas Lewis and Tolkien cultivate in their readers. The vision statement and mission of this organization to be bold, creative, and strategic, and to work for justice while caring and trusting one another towards a future that is just, prosperous, equitable, and safe from the effects of the climate crisis, reflects the importance of story in cultivating creativity and a sense of community and justice. This is how God calls us to live. And in this way, creation care is an extension of our call to love our neighbor. How does time spent in the fictional creations of Lewis and Tolkien transform us? Could reading their fiction really help us cultivate a stronger land ethic? I would argue that the stories of Lewis and Tolkien encourage us to take time for a closer reading of creation so that we can know more about the natural world. This knowledge will transform us so that we can recognize our place as a part of creation and our role as stewards. Finally, we change the way we interact with the natural world by cultivating humility in our use and protection of resources, having contentment with using only what is needed and delighting in creation. So how do we work towards a closer reading of nature? Well, literature is an important vehicle to introduce children to the natural world. Many believe that literature written for children provides a way to connect understanding and action. In fact, literature might be a critical means towards transforming our actions toward creation because it is becoming less common for children to spend their childhoods in imaginative play outdoors. Less time spent in nature could have serious implications for creation care as we, spend to, as we begin to reinforce ideas including dominance of separateness from and consumption of nature. We see this manifest in a phenomenon called plant blindness, which is described as the inability to recognize or notice plants in our environment, or the inability to recognize the importance of plants and plant biodiversity. Children often are not introduced to plants in school, and much of the modern literature read by or television watched by children emphasize animals over plants. However, plant blindness can be addressed by intentionally introducing children to the natural world via mentors who teach them about botany, just as Tolkien's mother did, or through exposure to plants and carefully selected literature. The campaigns to increase children's literacy regarding plants and the environment seem to be falling short because in 2007, the Oxford Junior Dictionary removed close to 40 words relating to the natural world in order to make space for words describing our more solitary and digital word world. Words like acorn, wren, bramble, dandelion, and willow were removed to make way for words including blog, broadband, chat room, and mp3. If a shift in vocabulary is an indication of current priorities, it is no surprise that fewer people are interested in caring for the environment. It is difficult to care for something that you don't know much about or have never experienced. In 2005, with the first edition of Last Child in the Woods, Richard Louv sounded the alarm that a childhood without nature could result in many negative effects, including health consequences. Louv coined this effect nature deficit disorder. And though it is not a medical diagnosis, nor was it ever intended to be, there is a significant body of evidence that suggests exposure to screens that tends to characterize a life indoors 
is associated with health conditions among children, including obesity, high blood pressure, insulin resistance, depression, suicidal ideation, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and dependence behavior. In addition to human health impacts, the trend of spending less time in nature seriously threatens biodiversity and conservation efforts. Louv warns that increasingly nature is something to watch, to consume, to wear, to ignore. Children that learn to consume nature are in danger of the effects of overconsumption and will grow to be adults still seeking fulfillment from consumption rather than a life captive to joy. As Edmund discovered with his desire for Turkish delight in C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the more he consumed, the more he desired, just to capture that initial pleasure. When nature is seen as something to consume, we also fail to understand our place and our role. This is especially problematic when it comes to making an argument for Christians to respond to the call for the care of creation. Conservative evangelicals are the least likely group in the United States to regard environmental protection as necessary or even biblical. An important reason for this is that many Christians understand that our role as image bearers separates us from creation. Many forget that we too have a creation story. Certainly, we have a distinct role in creation. However, when we think of ourselves as being outside of creation, we understand the words of dominion or subdue as permission or even a command to control or consume creation without limits. In fact, when we see ourselves as separate from creation, it is easier to disregard our impacts on natural systems. We begin, um, we begin to think of the world we live in as simply a pretty backdrop for our important task of sharing the gospel. Perhaps we're experiencing a new kind of plant blindness, a creation blindness exacerbated by a broken understanding of our role in creation. In Genesis, God tasks Adam with keeping the garden. The language used for this task is the same language used later in the Old Testament to describe serving in the temple. Thus, Adam was tasked with caring for the place where God dwells. Additionally, Christians acknowledge the incarnation of God in Christ. We worship God who came and lived among his creation, who was part of creation. Modern Christians too often may not consider the incarnation as pointing us back to the idea of creation as the temple where God dwells. Rather, when we read Colossians 1, we fail to recognize that when Christ, when Christ returns to reconcile all things, creation is included. Instead, our understanding of the gospel is one in which salvation is internal and about an individual soul. Accordingly, salvation is private, not shared with community, and depends on the belief, acceptance of each individual. As W. Porter explains, modernity has created a situation in which most people do not expect to encounter God in their daily affairs. God is not expected to appear in our shared public life. If we are interested in God, we pray privately or go to church. Ultimately, when we forget that creation is the place where God dwells, we forget our own place in creation and begin to think of our role in creation as simply utilitarian. If we can transform that mindset and truly begin to see ourselves as part of creation, we will make decisions based on a more expanded view of community. In this way, we can actually begin to participate in the reconciliation that Christ promises us in Colossians 1, 15 through 20. We read, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, 
and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood on the cross. In the fictional writings of Lewis and Tolkien, we can see the importance of such transformation and understanding. C.S. Lewis personally experienced such a transformation when he became a Christian. He had long pursued joy. Nearly all that I loved, I believed to be imaginary, he said. Nearly all that I believed to be real, I thought grim and meaningless. The exceptions were certain people, whom Lewis loved and believed to be real, and nature herself. After Lewis became a Christian, though, he began to recognize these joys as opportunities to experience the presence of God. He says, at best, our faith and reason will tell us that God is adorable, but we shall not have found him so. Not have tasted and see. Any patch of sunlight in a wood will show you something about the sun, which you could never get from reading books on astronomy. These pure and spontaneous pleasures are patches of godlight in the woods of our experience. Recognizing these opportunities to enjoy the presence of God in creation is an essential first step towards understanding our role as caretakers of the place where God dwells. Many of Lewis's stories describe characters that go through some similar transformations. In The Magician's Nephew, Diggory is motivated by his personal desire to save his mother from an illness. His focus remains on this goal, even after experiencing the magnificence of Aslan's creation song. Aslan tasks him with recovering an apple that will protect Narnia from the evil witch. When he arrives at the tree, he is further tempted by the witch to take the apple for himself, as it will surely cure his mother. Diggory's choice to reject the witch's tempting taunts and to return the apple to Aslan is a choice for all of creation. Dickerson and O'Hara explain, the most beneficial thing one can do for oneself is not try to gain dominion over all creation, but to acknowledge one's place in it by caring for the tree. The tree cares for Narnia. By doing the will of Aslan, Diggory receives his greatest desire. Just as Diggory's choice to plant a tree benefited a greater community and protected all of Narnia, our choices about how we use natural resources can impact our neighbors. Our choices to use resources wisely and not to seek pleasure by overconsuming will result in healthier ecosystems that will sustain the nutritional and resource needs of many neighbors, both those from far away and those who live nearby. Tolkien's fiction can also point us to the importance of a transformation of ideas about our role as created caretakers. All of the races present throughout Middle Earth are part of creation, even if there is a hierarchy of roles. As we humans are made in the image of God to have a special role with the creator and to be stewards of creation, the elves seem to be set apart as they play an important role in preserving beauty and wilderness. To maintain the beauty of creation is to perpetuate the praise song of creation. In Middle-earth, there are other races that teach us about stewardship. The Ents, the earthborn, as old as mountains, teach us the importance of wild places and represent the preservation model of stewardship. They provide us with the memory of the land. As Treebeard explains to Marion Pippin, the implications of that history, he says, those were the broad days. Time was when I could walk and sing all day and hear no more than the echo of my own voice in the hollow hills. The woods were thicker, stronger, younger, and the smell of the air. I used to spend a week just breathing. Treebeard then describes what the land became. He says, we crossed over Anduin and came to their land, but we found a desert. It was all burned and uprooted for war had passed over it. And then he shares his thoughts about the future. He says, I do not like worrying about the future. I'm not altogether on anybody's side, if you understand me. Nobody cares for the woods as I care for them, not even the elves nowadays. And finally, Treebeard describes the cost of power and consumption. Saruman is plotting to become a power. 
He is a mind of metal and wheels, and he does not care for growing things, except as far as they serve him for the moment. The hobbits represent a sustainable use model of stewardship. They live in an agrarian society and depend on small scale agriculture. The simple life of hobbits demonstrates a low impact approach to resource use that is both hospitable to the land, only taking what is needed, and results in a community built on hospitality to neighbors. When ideas about resources slowly change while Frodo is away, we see firsthand the devastating effects on the land and on the community. Frodo's response to the scouring of the Shire is to lead a conservation or stewardship response. Perhaps the most important way Tolkien works to transform our mindset away from thinking that we are apart from creation is by teaching us through Frodo and Sam that sometimes we must sacrifice our own desires so that others will have what they need in the future. I'm sure many of you remember this conversation between Sam and Frodo. But, said Sam, and tears started in his eyes, I thought you were going to enjoy the Shire too, for years and years after all you have done. So I thought too once, but I have been too deeply hurt, Sam. I tried to save the Shire, and it has been saved, but not for me. It must often be so, Sam. When things are in danger, someone has to give them up, lose them so that others may keep them. But you are my heir. All that I had and might have had, I leave to you. Like Frodo, are we able to make courageous decisions that will positively impact the future of our world? What kind of environment will we leave behind for future generations? When we spend more time in nature and experience it more often through literature, Lewis and Tolkien would have us understand that we will learn to love God's creation more as we move away from ideas that nature is simply to be consumed. This shift in attitudes will make a significant difference in our own choices and actions as we truly begin to apprehend that we are created beings and thus part of creation. As a result, we will begin to more fully understand that we are image bearers created by God with a specific role to steward creation. Finally, along with our increased awareness that we are part of creation, we will realize that any harm that comes to nature will eventually harm us or our neighbors living in fragile ecosystems that cannot support sustained overuse of resources. This new perspective will gradually help us to cultivate humility in our use and protection of resources, to exercise contentment with consuming only what is needed and to joyfully enhance our delight in creation. As Revelation 4.11 declares, thou art worthy, O God, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they were, are and were created. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Page, so much for the a stunning presentation. I kept thinking of that verse from Romans 8, for all of creation groans together in travail. Before I introduce the respondent for this evening, I want to remind you that you can put questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens, and I will curate them after Christina Bieber Lake speaks to us. And to that end, I am delighted to introduce her for many different reasons, not least of which is the fact that I recently quoted Dr. Lake in an, um, my current book project. And um, I am delighted with the incredibly smart work she's doing. She has been part of the Wheaton College English Department since 1999, having completed a PhD at Emory University. And even though she specializes in American literature, uh, her interests clearly harmonize with those of the Wade. For one thing, Dr. Lake is um, the endowed chair of, that honors Clyde L. S. Kilby, 
who started the Wade collection, and she upholds his reputation for superb teaching by reaching out and mentoring teachers, especially during these covid times. And I recommend that you look up her book, The Flourishing Teacher. Second, Dr. Lake's scholarship focuses on the truth of narrative fiction. And her current book project argues that story is inherently theological, which is a proposition that would intrigue many of, or most of our Wade authors. So with no further ado, Dr. Lake. Thank you so much for that introduction. I appreciate that. <clears throat> and I can't tell you how excited I was to be asked to be the respondent to Dr. Page's paper this evening because it quietly but forcefully proves that if we give up on the liberal arts, we will be giving up on the environment as well. And the reason for that is primarily actually because Dr. Page is herself no run of the mill, sit in the silo biologist. She is herself as a scholar and a teacher, a perfect example of our deep need for what only the liberal arts can offer. And that is an understanding of the interconnectedness that we have with each other, with the natural world, and with Jesus Christ. And you just saw a perfect example of that tonight. Dr. Page is the most voracious reader of fiction of all the scientists that I have ever met. And maybe you don't know, but she's also a gifted photographer. I have no doubt that many of those images were from her own camera. So since she is herself an artist, she deeply understands that it is art that most powerfully transforms our vision of the world. And that's what her paper was about. So I'm delighted to extend her insights for just a few minutes here. So the moment in her paper that I'll begin with is her conversation with Bill McKibben. If you don't know his name, he has had a huge impact on the fight to defend our environment, both in his speaking, his organization abilities, his books, and so on. And Dr. Page's paper explains how he became an advocate and how one in general becomes an advocate. And we saw that McKibben was deeply moved by the central place given to the natural world by the Inklings writers. McKibben felt how C.S. Lewis cherished the forest. You see, McKibben's moral imagination was shaped at a very early age by the power of story, particularly the power of story to make us pay attention to what we see without actually seeing every day. Without those stories to help him to feel a resonance with the natural world, he wouldn't be the champion of the environment that he is today, nor would Dr. Page, and nor would I, a non-scientist, have learned to care. After I read this paper, things started exploding in my mind, and it occurred to me that Kristen, who's a friend, and I are like two versions of the same person. She's the lover of nature and books and art who became a biologist, I'm the lover of nature and books and art who became a literature scholar. And this paper inspired me to remember my earliest adventures in reading, all of which have a thread running through them that's easy to see. The actual earliest book I remember from childhood was called, What Shall I Put in the Hole That I Dig? And the protagonist, such as it is in a children's book, discovers that buttons that are put into a hole do not grow into button trees and so on basic plant biology, right? That book stuck in my brain. I was later obsessed with a book called My Side of the Mountain, in which the protagonist runs off to live alone in nature. He learns how to live off the land, including making acorn pancakes. The wildness of this captured my imagination. So imagine my shriek of horror when I saw that acorn was one of the words that the Oxford Junior Dictionary felt it needed to remove to make space for tech heavy words. It was a small step from that book to the work of Henry David Thoreau. It was reading mm -hmm. and loving Walden that turned me into an English major with a focus on American literature. Because for Thoreau, to be a poet is to be a naturalist. And to be a naturalist is to be a poet. For him, they're truly one and the same. 
Now, I give this information only as background for drawing out and highlighting Dr. Page's most important point that in order to be moved to care for the forest, we must learn how to see it differently. And that is work that's best done by the storyteller and the poet. We must learn to see it as Lewis and Tolkien did as alive. We must learn to see it as endangered by the forces of careless or rapacious industry. And most of all, we must learn to see that our flourishing is utterly dependent on the forest's flourishing. We need to see ourselves like tiny hobbits sitting in the branches of the bigger and more powerful tree beard. So Dr. Cage carefully points out that Christian notions of subduing the earth and even of stewardship have not generally been persuasive enough even to Christians on this last point. So it's up to us as the Christians of the 21st century to imagine a different kind of relationship between ourselves and the forest. And that I think requires art to help us to see. And it turns out that like the Inklings, many American writers have also offered this vision. And I'm proposing that we think of ourselves not just as stewards, but as interdependent caretakers. Interdependent caretakers. This is just my way of phrasing the land ethic that Dr. Page mentioned. My way of agreeing with her conclusion that any harm that comes to nature will eventually harm us or our neighbors. There were many American writers who believe this to be true. So there are super tons of examples, but I'm just going to show two. The first shows the story of the importance, the, uh, excuse, the, the importance of story to fuel our sense of responsibility. And the second of poetry to help us to see and feel the beauty of the created world. And this is just a blatant plea for anyone who can hear my voice to read these things and let them change you. This is what literature professors are all about. First, Richard Powers, The Overstory. In many ways, this award-winning novel is the novel for our age. It's impossible to describe this novel. You really got to experience it. Experience it. It is structured in a way that illustrates our interdependence with the forest, stories interlaced with each other and with actual trees like a magnificent root system. The novel illustrates one of the epigraphs that the book offers from the scientist who proposed the Gaia theory of the earth, James Lovelock. Lovelock writes that, quote, earth may be alive, not as the ancients saw her, a sentient goddess with a purpose and foresight, but alive like a tree, a tree that quietly exists, never moving except to sway in the wind, yet endlessly conversing with the sunlight and soil, using sunlight and water and nutrient minerals to grow and change, but all done so imperceptibly that to me, the old oak tree on the green is the same as it was when I was a child." End quote. Now, let me just add that you don't need to be a proponent of the Gaia hypothesis to agree with this particular statement, which is really not woo-woo. The overstory as a novel sinks us into the quiet life of trees and of the people who is all of us whose every breath depends on the earth's living forests. It's a remarkable book. I encourage you to take time with it. Now, there are also hundreds of poets I could choose whose work begs us to see and respect the beauty of the natural world in the forest. But I've chosen, of course, Robert Frost, the farmer poet. I've chosen him primarily because it was a student of mine in my Robert Frost class who came up with a brilliant metaphor to describe the relationship that Frost sees between the farmer poet and the natural world. And that metaphor is husbandry. Now let's leave aside the, any gender associations with this word and go to its Middle English roots, which simply mean farmer and man. The word still carries rather genteel associations of cultivation and care. It's care that comes from the fact that we need the land more than it needs us, but it does indeed need us. The answer to our God-given interdependence is not the fantasy of eliminating all humans and letting nature run wild. When we cultivate the land, when we husband it properly, it also flourishes. We flourish, it flourishes. Frost believed that poetic rhythm and meter 
resonated with the beauty of the created world. So that for him, to write a good poem is to husband language properly, so that it allows the reader to see the beauty of the land. This becomes especially clear in his early poem called Mowing, in which the speaker talks about how his scythe whispers as it clears the grasses, not unlike how a poet revises his speech until it sings with the truth that it is uncovering. So the, inspe the speaker insists, this is just a few of the lines, the speaker says, quote, it was no dream of the gift of idle hours or easy gold at the hand of fay or elf. Anything more than the truth would have seemed too weak to the earnest love that laid the swale in rows, end quote. Note that the speaker insists that it is earnest love, earnest love that puts the swale, which is the low marshy places, into rows. Cultivation. Cultivation without love is destruction. Love without cultivation is utopian fantasy. This same sentiment is expressed in his poem, The Woodpile, a famous poem, in which the speaker finds himself lost in the woods, far away from home until he comes across a solitary cord of maple cut and split and measured. Now, Frost is not saying that the only way to know a forest is to cut it down, far from it. Frost is saying that to be at home on this earth, if only for the short time that we've been allotted, we must be the best of husbands. We must be caretakers who recognize our interdependence on that which we care for. In this poem, the speaker gently chides the woodcutter for spending his labor on this pile and then forgetting about it, leaving it there, quote, far from a useful fireplace and subject instead to entropy. That is waste. And waste is inevitable when we forget the fact of our interdependence on a natural world. And many more of Frost's poems explore these ideas. So I urge you to spend some time with them as well. So besides their support for the land ethic, what do these two writers share? Here is what's really important. They insist that it's only when we learn how to give our attention to the natural world that we will learn how to see it. This is why Power's novel is so long. He knows that we need an immersion of several hours for our moral imaginations to be shaped. Frost also knows that we need to sit with a poem for a long time to see that its beauty is also an argument for the beauty of its subject. So with that, I just wanna say thank you, Dr. Page, for directing our attention to such a needful area in such a winful, winsome way. Thank you. We have time for questions now, and we have asked Dr. Lake to ask the first question of Dr. Page. So why don't you proceed? Yes, I will. And uh, this is, you know, you can take this any way you want. I love the quote that you read from Tolkien where he says, in all my works, I take the part of trees as against all their enemies. While Florian is beautiful because there the trees were loved because your paper shows us that we've got to love something if we want to care for it. And then thinking of Fangorn Forest, it's like we have to have some awe too. We should be taught to have some awe as well as love. So I just want to know what books you read or that you've read to your child that kind of have been significant to you in that, uh, in that area. And if nothing comes immediately to mind, what can we do to help counter plant blindness? Um, and well, so first I have to say, I also yes. read The Upper Story. <laughs> it's such a beautiful book. It's, it's such a beautiful book. Um, wow. And um, so many things that you can read to cultivate that awe. Um, My Side of the Mountain is a beautiful book. Um, I love those books that kind of take you back in time to a time in nature where it was maybe a little bit more like the Shire, a little bit yeah. more um, down to earth, um, using what you need not extracting more than you need. Um, gosh, I read so many things. What can, and now I can't think of anything. I was like- Well, I know, and I didn't mean to put you on the spot and I know how it's, what it feels like to, to have that happen, but so you read My Side of the Mountain though. I did, I did. Yeah. Um, and um, so did Wren. Um, we had to add her name to the, can you believe they took Wren off the, out of the dictionary? Oh, well, that's one of the words they took out of the dictionary along with acorn. 
Yes, yeah, and acorns and dandelions. So, so there's actually a beautiful book um, about those books. It's by um, about those words that were removed. Um, Jackie Morris is an artist, and she illustrated all of the words that were lost. And the book is called Lost Words. Oh, that's, that's actually a really beautiful book to introduce children to awe, and they learn to love nature through those visual books. Any any book with um, beautiful art about um, mm -hmm. the land is, is something that I really love to share with Ren. Yeah, wonderful, yeah. We find several people who have asked questions who are really appreciating your photographs, Kristen. Yes. And one anonymous uh, person asked, could you tell us where the first pictured forest is and what took you there? Is it a place you visited often? So yes, um, well, not often. Um, that is a forest in India. It's in Northern India um, near Dehradun. And it is, well, I haven't been there except for during the rainy season. So I hear that you can see the Himalayas from there, um, but it's, um, it's up on the edge of the mountains. It's just gorgeous, a really, really old forest. Um, it would, I've been there um, three times visiting hunger students and we always go there for retreat. Um, it's um, a place where we can get away and we can spend time together in nature and quiet, it's so quiet there. Something about those, um, those evergreen forests that dampen the sound and um, I don't know, they're very peaceful places. So you actually saw quite a few pictures from that forest. Um, yeah, and maybe for some of our listeners, you need to explain what you mean by hunger students. Yes, I'm sorry, yes. Um, hunger is a program at Wheaton College. Um, it stands for Human Needs and Global Resources. And it's one of the gyms um, along with the Wade Center at, at Wheaton College. Um, Students can major in anything and get a certificate in this program. And they learn about poverty and, and justice and accompaniment um, through coursework. And in their senior year, they do an internship, typically, not this year, but typically in a developing country, working with organizations that come alongside people um, for justice and other things. So my students that have been in India have typically been in medical types of internships or public health types of internships. Great. Someone else picked up on your wonderful photograph of the biscuit tin and asked this question, what place is there for cultivated landscapes or degraded ones in imagination? Do these appear in your author's fictional landscapes? If so, how and for what purpose? Well, there's definitely places for, for created landscapes. Um, I think that that's part of art, but you don't really create beautiful places unless you know real, you know, un, undisturbed places. Um, and so when Ren and I made that Biscuit Tin Garden um, for this talk, um, we picked all of the beautiful things that, that draw us in when we're actually in a forest together. We're always picking up acorns and and hickory nuts and moss and um, little little berries and um, and just tiny things. But we created something new and beautiful out of it, um, expressing it in a in a new arrangement. Maybe envisioning that a squirrel left a little cherry pit. Um, uh, there's a lot of things there. Um, you you can maybe we can um, put the picture somewhere that people can look up close and personal. Um, degraded landscapes are harder, they are, you know, the degraded landscapes create that tension in the story so that you realize what you're missing. Um, you know, when you, when Treebeard is lamenting the loss of his, of his beloved friends in that forest, um, I don't think you really understand the evilness of Saruman until you, at least I didn't, um, until I experienced Treehorn, um, Treebeard's lament and, and cry about what had been lost. So it wasn't just about the beauty that was lost, but it was about the, um, the relationships that were lost. And without that loss, then you wouldn't actually appreciate the rest of the beauty. So it is important to be there. Uh, but um, I would love for us to get to a world where we don't have so much devastation in landscapes um, in the real world. Mm -hmm. Here's a question from Gail Harlow. 
um, somewhat humorous. She wants to know whether in the woods between the worlds in The Magician's Nephew, do you think several were ants? Mm. I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I I don't know. I mean, in this in the in the sense that um, that there are you know they're both talking, both Lewis and Tolkien are talking about kind of the spirit, the aliveness of trees. I mean, there's something similar there, um, but I feel like it was more about the grove growing than the protector of the grove. But but that's just my reading of it. So. Mm. Thank you. This is from Jeffrey Barbeau. Uh, he says, I love the images you've included in your talk. You emphasize the way nature is not only beautiful, but also vulnerable. It got me thinking, I wonder if you might briefly share some of the ways that nature seems to act, even on us, and what we might begin to learn about that side of creation. Hmm. So I guess the first thing that popped into my mind um, when I hear that, Jeff, is um, the way that nature tries to recover after we've harmed it actually is harmful to us. You know, it actually goes back to the story of the fall, right? Um, the, the, the thorns that come in, when you cut a forest or when you put animals to forage in a forest, the only thing that's gonna survive are the thorns, which makes it really complicated to enjoy the remnant of the forest. So I feel like we learn about how we, I mean, nature does teach us through, by kind of harming us um, about how we harm it. So. Mm -hmm. um, here's a question for either of you. Uh, would you consider requiring one of the books in the Chronicles of Narnia for all incoming first year students? at Wheaton College in the Core 101 course to help them to learn how to see and care for creation? And if so, which of the books would you think most help in that purpose? What do you think, Dr. Bieber Lake? You know, I'm not sure. I mean, there's so much we're trying to do in that class already. That's one of the problems that we've got with it. and that's one of the books that we can actually rely on students having read many of them before they come in. So it's hard to know. Um, we do uh, teach, at least I do, Leaf by Niggle, which I think is a really interesting way to kind of get at some of these issues um, in a kind of roundabout way. But what do you think, Kristen? Well, I don't, um, boy, I'd have a hard time picking which mm -hmm. one. I'd probably have to pick parts of several. Yeah. I think I would, I mean, I guess if I had, I was really drawn to the magician's nephew just because of that, um, the part that I pulled out with Diggory making, like realizing he can't keep the apple for himself. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, so I think yeah. that that might be, that would be a good one. And, and also of course, the, the creation song is just beautiful there, so. Mm. Someone else asks, uh, could you, either of you talk about any people you know who have different abilities, disabilities, um, and how they experience learning about nature? Anyone you know who has taught you about new ways of coming to know nature, even without sight or mobility? Well, so I actually, I have, two good friends that I spent a lot of time in nature with who are colorblind and they love nature as much as I do. And I know they find it as beautiful as I do, but we must experience the beauty in different ways because I can see color. Mm -hmm. And I often think about them as we're walking and hiking together. Um, they remind me, I'll say, oh, look at how beautiful that red flower is. And they're like, where is it? You know, because red, you know, yeah. so, but they, they kind of ch help me realize that we all appreciate beauty in different ways. And then I also have a good friend who um, is in, has been in a wheelchair for a long time. And um, I always, I, I always take it for granted that I can just go where I want to go and experience what I want to experience. And um, she can't get to a lot of the places that I can get to. Yet she, she gets out and enjoys nature to her best. But I think that 
that's another part of the conversation is like we how much of nature can be accessible how can we how can we make it accessible to everybody because it is important for everybody mm -hmm. mm. kenton senna asks um based on tolkien's portrayal of natural spaces especially lothlorien the shire etc um, it's just beautiful descriptions, but Tolkien also portrays environmental degradation, Isengard, Mortar, Saruman's Shire, and ecological restoration, the tree garth of Orthanic, Sam's Shire, etc. Can you comment on Tolkien's ecological restoration in, through the lens of biblical redemption? Hmm. Well, you can come, my second talk is going to deal more with this, perhaps. Oh, okay. so, um, <laughs> something, yes. Yeah, something to look forward <laughs> to. I'm still, I'm still trying to actually kind of unpack that in my mind. Um, but I think that, um, I think that maybe the, what I would come to on the spot is that there is reconciliation like it's not hopeless. Like there, there's so much destruction yet you do see hope in the end. And, and that's the way it is now in creation that we are very powerful creatures. We exert a lot of pressure in the name of power and desire and want for the wrong things. Yet there is hope in Christ and he is coming back and he will reconcile things. Um, that doesn't give us permission to keep acting the way that we're acting. Um, but I think I, even in all of the destruction I see throughout Tolkien's um, story, I see that glimpse of hope. I mean, that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's a question that comes all the way from Japan. Kyoko Yuasa asks, can you share, either of you, a real and spiritual experience of wind that you had when you walked in the forest. And she thinks of the ecstasy from the wind, Tolkien and Dyson relished when the three, Tolkien, Dyson and Lewis walked in on Addison's walk on the night of September 20th, 1931. And of course that famous incident, Mitzi came back. They heard a rush of wind and a sound of pattering leaves, felt that it was raining and somehow suddenly all three held their breath. I interpret this Lewis, as Lewis statement as two kinds of wind blowing to them, real and perhaps spiritual. So the, it goes back to the original question, have you experienced that, that the spiritual implications of wind? Well, I, I would like to start with that because okay. that's been a huge part of my own uh, faith. The, I have always felt that God was talking to me when the wind was blowing in my face when I was out in the natural world. And I mean, since a young, young child. So there was something to me just sort of automatically spiritual about it because it just felt, well, I mean, it says in the scripture, right? It's invisible, like the Holy Spirit. You don't see where it comes from, where it's going. And, and it just always communicated God's presence to me. So it was really delightful to see that question uh, coming on, like the, you know, because so much about uh, life is about breath and the breath of God, inspiration of the Holy Spirit and so on. So absolutely, I have definitely had deep spiritual experiences with wind. Hmm. Yeah, I think, I think most of my um, most important spiritual experiences have been in forests, I'm not sure about wind, I haven't, probably, but for me, it's more about the quiet, quietening of, mm -hmm. of nature, um, but all of the, the whole experience. So like, I, as I described, for me, it's very sensory, it's smell and mm -hmm. what I'm feeling and what I'm hearing. Um, so, yeah, and I think um, I'm thinking about the places where I do experience wind when I'm in nature, and I'm usually very winded when I get to the top of a mountain. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> but yes, I mean, I, I definitely experience um, God more. Um, he's more real to me when I'm not in a building, when I'm in his creation. Mm -hmm. Here's something from Caleb Luke. Uh, could you share, Dr. Page, some stories of your interactions with folks who are in the business of deforestation? Mm -hmm. 
What are their concerns and how have you found common ground in hearing their economic needs and the importance of conservation for a variety of other needs? Caleb, I can leave it to you to ask me that question. <laughs> um, okay, so I, I did go to school in a forestry school and um, I the Bible does not tell us we can't use resources, right? So. I, um, I studied, my studies at both Auburn and at Purdue gave me lots of conversations with people that we just don't necessarily shame that share the same life experience or the same way of thinking about resources. But, but because of the way that we have engaged the land in North America, I'm gonna to speak to North America. Um, we have a history of like forestry and agriculture um, that persists. And in a sense, um, some of the ways that we need to, to learn about working with the land, um, we have to understand um, forestry practices, like when do we remove, um, we have even age stands, for example, because we grow them all at the same time. So all the trees are the same age. And as a result, then you have diseases that emerge and you have to understand how to manage kind of a not so natural system anymore what we see might not be what was original, right? Um, so how do, I, how do I work with them? I'm trying to, I'm trying to get there. Um, well, we work together fine, um, but I love to have conversations about traditional or what, what we would consider traditional, kind of the European style of, of resource management and how it might learn from indigenous ways of thinking about resource management. And that's really my favorite conversation to have because I think that um, it would be very unrealistic to think that we could give up on um, the type of management, land management that we have been engaged in for so long. Um, but we might think of new ways to re-envision it and incorporate um, really kind of some of the spirit of what we read in Lewis and Tolkien about, um, about really caring for creation um, by listening, realizing that the land is alive and realizing that we're part of it, realizing that we are dependent on it or as, as, as Christina said, um, what did you say? Interdependent caretakers. Um, so kind of melding the kind of the more European style of resource management with maybe a more indigenous style is something that I'm really trying to learn about now, thinking about um, being that interdependent caretaker, so. Mm -hmm. This is related to what you're talking about. Um, how can people, this is from Dan, Daniel Rue, how can those who live in supremely urban environments connect and relate with nature and the literature of nature? So I think that literature is a big, a big part of that. Right, so spending some time in literature, even if you're in a very urban environment, will take you outside of that urban environment into new environments. Um, but I would also say, look out your window because urban environments are quite natural. There are a lot of things to be loved and, and discovered there. Um, grow a garden, um, watch birds, um, look at the trees that are growing in the city. Um, there's a lot to be um, appreciated in an urban environment but you'll learn to know what to look at by spending time in literature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, good point. Um, this is uh, <clears throat> a question about moving on from forested landscapes. Are there facets of nature that you think are more difficult to write about in ways that connect with readers than others. For example, bare earth, rocky places, deserts, bodies of water, um, it, or any experiences of being surprisingly nourished by a book's description of a place that would be unlovely in your own background. So a book helped you see the unlovely as lovely. That is such a great question that I wish I had more time to think about because I can't, I mean, I know that there are examples of that and I just can't think of them off the top of my head. Mm. I'll ponder that for a... Mm. When mm. I read um, Out of the Silent Planet, I felt like it was at first unlovely. I didn't think it, mm. when I was there, I didn't feel like it was 
I included it in this talk on purpose because it was such a different type of landscape. And I did learn, I did feel more, it was just a, such a new landscape um, that it felt uncomfortable and unsettling, but it became beautiful as you traveled with Ransom. And um, I think that for me, like off the top of my head that that might be where I would go with mm -hmm. that, that answer. Dr. Bieber Lake and Dr. Page, thank you so much for joining us. Before we finish, there are some announcements I'd like to share with everyone. Um, first, the next lecture in this series by Dr. Page is titled A Lament for Creation. And that will be held online Thursday, February 11th at 7 p.m. with Noah Tolley responding. Uh, meanwhile, you can join us Wednesday, November 18th for the launch of the book that resulted from the 2018-19 Hansen Lectureship by Dr. Jerry Root. It is called Splendor in the Dark, C.S. Lewis's Dimer in His Life and Work. And finally, if you're not already on the Wade email list, you can click on the chat button and you can sign up via link so you can know about all these events that the Wade is sponsoring. Thank you for a very fertile, pun intended, a very fertile uh, conversation this evening. It was absolutely marvelous. Thank you all who attended and asked questions. Bye-bye. <laughs>